Church, how you feeling today? Show us 
Feel.
Psalm 91 says, his massive arms are wrapped around you, protecting you. You can run under his covering of majesty and hide. His arms of faithfulness are a shield keeping you from harm. Church, what if, what if what we perceive as darkness is really just the shadow of his wings? What if that's the covering of his majesty that we can run under and hide under? I don't know about you, but that's so encouraging to me. That what if what I perceive as darkness is just his protection, just his covering, just his mercy? Amen, amen. Why don't you guys go ahead and greet your neighbor and then go ahead and take your seat. Good morning. Oh, you were still greeting each other. Good morning. My name's Chris. I'm the youth pastor here at City Hope. And if, if I could talk to the parents in the room just for a moment. Parents, one of our goals at City Hope Youth is to come alongside you to help your student have a real and active relationship with Jesus Christ. And we do that by offering things like youth nights every Wednesday night at 6.30 in the theater. We have our summer camp coming up. This summer, we're also taking a mission trip to Honduras. We're gonna go down there and serve with our campus that's already there. And so if you have any questions about this or wanna find out how your student can be more involved, we'd ask that you stop by one of our banners in the commons or simply go to cityhope.cc youth. And I get the opportunity to travel around to several of our campuses. And, and on some of these campuses, we, we, we hear some things like people will, will come in and they'll see all these incredible volunteers serving. And they'll think, man, they don't, they don't need me here. And that couldn't be further from the truth. We need you. This is why at City Hope we offer something called Next. It happens during the 1130 service in the theater. Because serving is not just something that we do, it's who we are. We believe that generosity is active and that we are never more fulfilled than when we are giving and serving, when we are engaged with what God has going on. In fact, for further proof of what happens when people engage with the vision that God has, we are only a couple weeks away from the launch of our newest City Hope campus in Midtown. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Pastor Jordy and our launch team have done a phenomenal job of making sure that this campus is ready to launch. So check this out. Hey City Hope, I am so excited that today I get to give you a really big announcement in the development of our Midtown campus. It's been almost a year and you guys have prayed for us, you've supported us all along the way. And here it is, March 31st, we're gonna have our very first service in Midtown at our Midtown campus. And man, I can't be more excited. Our goal is to be a church that welcomes everybody in and gives them the hope of Jesus. We can't wait to see what God's gonna do in this community. We are counting down the days, quite literally, for the launch of City Hope Midtown. Thank you so much to all of you that came out to serve day, but we're not finished yet. We are so excited to be sharing the hope of Jesus to all the families in Midtown. So come out and be a part on March the 31st. Also, get on social media, either on Facebook or at City Hope Live on Instagram, and help us spread the word by sharing the news of the launch date. The Bible says that giving a tithe is an act of worship, and City Hope is full of faithful and generous givers. We don't pass around an offering basket because we want our guests to know that we don't want anything from you today. We just want you to enjoy your visit. You have to know that the local and global missions, the partnership with parents in our youth programs, and the creative ways we find to present the gospel to hurting people is absolutely propelled by your generosity. Over 50% of you now give online, so if you're looking for an opportunity to give, head over to cityhope.cc slash give to check out all the options. We're called to not just stay, but to go. We have opportunities here in our own city, as well as all across the world to do just that. You can check out cityhope.cc slash local or cityhope.cc slash go to see what opportunities are coming up this year. Ladies, listen up. If you're anything like me, you've already got your kids taken care of and your outfit picked out because you know nothing will stop you from being a part of this year's unique conference. Hear me when I say this event sells out every single year. So what are you waiting for? 
The early bird prices are good through the end of March, so call your mama, your sister, your girlfriends, the girl who cuts your hair, the teller at the bank, and every other girl you know, and get your ticket today at uniqueconference.cc. You might not know it, but you need this weekend, so don't get caught stuck at home. Get your ticket today. What's up, City Hope? How's everybody doing? It's great to see you guys in church with us today. Welcome to every single location, everybody that's watching online, all the guys at the correctional centers. Uh, it's so good to have you guys in church with us today. We are wrapping up the series Death and All of His Friends today. Um, and I'm excited about today's topic, and we will get to that in just a moment. Um, before I do that, before I kind of jump into that and kind of wrap it up, um, I just want to address something that took place this past week um, that, you know, some of us may have felt a little bit. And if you're not feeling it, I want you to feel it. So I want to bring it to your attention. Um, I woke up Friday morning hearing the news of what happened in Christchurch, New Zealand, um, and, and it, it weighed heavily on me. Um, and to be real, to be real honest, I'm, I'm tired of it. I'm over it. Um, the hatred, the racism, all the stuff that is just all over not only our country, but our world. Um, and when these kind of acts of just senseless terrorism happen against humanity, um, I can't help but go back to the heart of Jesus Christ. Um, and it grieves me, as it should grieve every Christ follower, because every human being on this planet is a human being that Jesus Christ died for. Every single one. Every single one. And, and maybe you're not completely familiar what happened, uh, but Friday morning or I guess Thursday night, uh, 49 people were, were shot down in two mosques in uh, Christchurch, New Zealand. 49 people lost their lives, dozens and dozens are injured, um, and it was all an act of racism and hatred. Um, and this is not the way of Jesus. Obviously, this is not the way of Jesus, but the way of Jesus for you and I to know is that we become the solution when there's hurt and there's pain and there's hatred in our world. We become the light. We become the love. We become Jesus with flesh and blood, hands and feet. We walk this planet with love. And I just want to encourage us to be that kind of church because that's who he's called us to be, to love people. Um, and, and Jesus loved every single person, and he still does, every single person. And he tells the story of the Good Samaritan to, to illustrate how we're to love. And the whole point of the story is about who our neighbor is. And he says, it's not necessarily the person sitting next to you. It's not necessarily the person that looks like you or has the same beliefs as you, doesn't have the same skin color as you, that doesn't even, they, don't, they, don't, they just don't even do life like you. He says, literally, these are the people that he's talking about, to love them like we love ourselves, right? This is the kind of love that Jesus has for humanity. And I just want to call us as a church to love that way. I want to pray uh, for the people affected. But here's what I want to pray. I want to pray for you. Because my guess is many of us in this place and at every campus know people from, that, um, that have a Muslim faith. That you go to school with them or you, um, you, you may work with some. You may have a neighbor that's a Muslim. Um, what if we, as the people of Jesus Christ, were light in a dark world? And this week we reached out because you know that community is reeling and grieving a lot more than probably the rest of the world is. So we have an opportunity to just love people, to love people the way that Jesus does. And I want to encourage you to do that, to listen to the Holy Spirit this week. God, what would you have me do? If I know someone that's a Muslim, how would you have me to love them and be a part of the solution and not the problem? Uh, and then I want to just quickly, I want to pray for the people that are affected by the tragedy. Will you guys pray with me? 
Let's pray. Jesus, we come to you right now, God, just in the midst of this, another just crazy tragedy that's happening in our world. Uh, God, we can't make sense of it. We don't understand it other than to know that this is a fallen world. Uh, And God, people are running and moving against your will and against your heart, and you love people. God, give us that love for people, God, that our heart would break when your heart breaks. God, whenever you see these kind of acts, God, are all around the world, whether people believe the way we believe or not, whether they have the same skin color as us or not, God, whatever it is, God, whether they think the way we think, I pray, God, that we would love them the way you love them. And, God, that we would be a part of the solution. And, God, I pray for every family that's been affected. I pray, God, for the, the, all, of, all of what's happening right now in New Zealand and all around the world, God, that you would bring hope into that situation. God, however it looks, Lord, I pray, God, that somehow these families would be introduced to the truth of Jesus Christ, the love of Jesus Christ. Lord, we love you and we thank you, God. Let us be part of the solution. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Um, all right. Well, I know we started off a little bit heavy, but um, it's not going to get much better, honestly, um, <clears throat> because we're in a series called Death and All of His Friends. And so today we talked about anxiety. We've talked about fear, which are really fun topics, really fun. Um, and then today we're going to talk about depression. All right. Everybody excited? All right. We're going to talk about depression, um, which, is, uh, which is not a fun topic to talk about. But here's the truth. Many people listening to me right now are battling some level of depression. Um, Most of our country is, most of our world is, the things we just talked about, the things that are on us, the things that are happening to us. Um, And and if I could, you know, anxiety and depression often play together. Uh, They often work very well together. Depression is often more tied to the past, where anxiety is more tied to the future. But they often play well together. And a lot of times if you're dealing with one, you're dealing with the other one. Um, and it's a crazy thing. So I may, I may slide a little bit of anxiety talk into this one as well, but we're really trying to hone in on depression as much as we can. And, and a lot of us have dealt with different levels of depression. We've, we've experienced it. And, and the thing about depression is that ultimately, at the end, it's a loss of hope. It's a loss of hope. And you've heard people with depression say that, it, that, they, that they lose interest in life, that food even loses its flavor. Uh, because it's ultimately it's a loss of hope and it's this inner tor- turmoil that begins to happen and it starts with thoughts and you know it's not just a bad day it's not even just a bad season but it's something that it just compounds and compounds into it's a it's a year of bad days and bad seasons and you just begin to feel I, I like to think about it like this this is the picture that I have is it's it's kind of like one cloud comes over your head and it blocks out the sun And then another cloud and another cloud and another cloud until the entire sky above you is a is a ceiling of darkness where there's no sunlight. There's no hope. There's no warmth that can get through. And as the clouds get thicker, it just pushes you into the earth. That's what it feels like to where you just feel like there's no hope. And when you're healthy and you have a good outlook on life, you could never understand why in the world someone would ever even think about suicide. Like it, it seems crazy and illogical and like you're going to hurt people. Like it just doesn't make sense. But when you are feeling that pressure of the entire sky pressing you into the earth and there is no hope in your life, then honestly, suicide looks like a release from what's going on, the hell that's on the inside of you. And so many people in our world are dealing with this right now. So many people. I said this a couple of weeks ago and I'll say it again that Wherever you are in that, and the thing about depression is it's sneaky, man. It will sneak up on you before you know it. And wherever you are in that spectrum of just a little bit, and you've had a season of a few months now where you just, you know, it's, it's getting easier and easier to just stay on the couch. It's getting easier and easier just to, to not do anything, and in your, your life is just kind of, it's just okay. I don't even care anymore. The things you used to love, it's just like, eh, whatever. Or maybe you're at the other end where it's decades of crippling depression, and you can't even leave the house, and it's hard for you to even get up. And, and how in the world am I going to take care of my kids? And you're dealing with that. And wherever you are on the spectrum of that, I want you to hear me say a couple of things. One, you're not alone. You're not alone. Not only are there hundreds of people that are listening to me right now that are dealing with depression, but there are people all around the globe that are dealing with depression. Not only that, it's all through the Bible we see that people dealt with depression. You're not alone. You're not the only one. The enemy would tell you, you're the only one with this problem. You're it. You're the only one. Go into a cave, go into a hole, because you're it. You're not it. Listen to this. In 2010, so nine years ago, there were 253 million prescriptions for antidepressants. 
253. By 2020, they estimate that the, that the depression drug market will be worth $16 billion just for depression. $16 billion. One in six Americans are on a psychiatric drug. One in six. Mental illness is in the U.S. has tripled since 1987. Listen, in 1950, it was one out of every, um, every uh, 40,000 people were diagnosed bipolar. Now it's one in every 40 since 1950, diagnosed bipolar. That's how quickly, and again, you look at the climate of what's going on in our world, you see why these things are rapidly increasing. Um, there were 47,000 suicides in 2017. And for every success, successful suicide, which is such a weird way to say suicide, talk about suicide, but for every successful suicide, there were nearly 100 failures. That's how many people attempted suicide or committed suicide. So this is the one that gets me. Suicide is the second leading cause of death in teenagers right now. 30, over 31% of all teenage deaths are by their own hand. You're not alone. And that right there should tell some of you and hopefully just be loud, you're not alone. Wherever you are right now, whatever you're dealing with, you're not the only one dealing with it. There are other people walking through this journey and dealing with this battle. There are dads, there are pastors, there are engineers, there are moms, there are teachers, there are counselors that are right here, that are dealing with the same thing. And then we go to the Bible and we see story after story after story, raw and uncut of prophets and teachers and evangelists and people of God that dealt with these, thing, these things as well. You're not alone. One of the ones that jumps out to me more than any other is Elijah, who arguably is one of the greatest um, prophets of the Old Testament. Right? Elijah was incredible so many miracles, so many incredible things, but Elijah dealt with depression and suicidal thoughts. He prays a very specific prayer of God, please kill me. And we're going to read that in just a second. But before he gets to this lowest of low moments in his life, he experiences a high of all highs. And this is very common with depression is you go from high highs to low lows. And every time you hit a low low, it gets a little bit lower and a little bit lower. And Elijah experienced this because the story goes in 1 Kings 18 that he was up against 450 prophets of Baal. And if you've been around church a while, you'll remember the story. I'm gonna hit it quick. But basically they're all saying, your God's not real, our God's real. And so Elijah says, prove it. So he says, call down fire from heaven and let your God burn this altar up. And we know, you know, they prayed and they prayed 450 guys praying and praying and praying and praying and nothing ever happened. And Elijah says, all right, watch this. He says, dump a million gallons of water on the altar. God light it up. Boom, done. And it was like amazing. It was like, it was like the ultimate Western showdown, you know, where they're like in a little old town and the tumbleweed goes across. Like it was that kind of like, this is on, this is about to go down. And all of a sudden Elijah's like, bam, drop it. Just like that. And it's this incredible thing. It's so incredible that the very next line, the very next line, he runs in completely across the valley in front of the king's chariot. He outruns the king's chariot because that's what you do on the greatest day of your life. You run. It's exciting. It's amazing. I lit that thing on fire. I'm going to run. This is incredible. But the very next moment is 1 Kings 19. Verse four, look at what happens. This is the same story. Then he went on alone into the wilderness, traveling all day. He sat down under a solitary broom tree and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord. Take my life, for I am no better than my ancestors who have already died. From a high, high to a low, low. And he said, it's just not, I just can't do this anymore. He was running from his life. He was fearful for his life. And he wound up all alone in a wilderness and he said, God, kill me now. Kill me now. You're not alone. You're not alone. And what's beautiful about this story and what should communicate to us is that in that moment, God didn't turn his back on Elijah. God didn't say, I'm done with you, man. How dare you watch this thing happen, this powerful move of God? How dare you do that and then immediately turn around and pray to die? How dare you? I'm done with you, man. 
No, no, he did the opposite. He leaned in. God leaned into his story and he whispered, come closer. Let me pull you in because he's not done. He said, there's still purpose in you. There's still hope left for you. Like it's not over for you. Come in close and let me communicate this to you. Listen, your faith is not broken if you're dealing with these things, right? God's not done with you. He's not finished. He pulled Elijah in and he said, let me talk to you. Let me whisper into your ear. And you know, the very first thing, the very first thing that God told Elijah to do was not a spiritual thing. Was not a spiritual thing because depression isn't just a spiritual issue. The very first thing that God told Elijah to do was get up and go eat and drink. That's what he told him to do. Because he was laying down all by himself, all into his own emotions. And he said, hey, get up. Let's get the blood pumping. Hey, get up. Move around a little bit, right? There's a physical side to this. And then the angel came and created some cake, the miraculous angel cake that's still miraculous. He created it on a rock and he said, eat that food because it's amazing. And then drink some water that I've provided for you. The very first thing he, he said was a physical act, a physical remedy. He said, get up, move around, get outside of the bubble you're in right now. Put some food in your belly, get some nourishment, get some strength. And now come pull closer and let me talk to you. Now come to a healthy place. Now come to a place where I can whisper in your ear and tell you what I want to tell you. And that's where we're going to pick up today. That's what I want you to hear today. It's not just a physical thing, and it's not just a spiritual thing. It's both. But the important thing for us to understand is after that, there's something so important that happens. And a a beautiful illustration of this is there was some guys in in the book of Psalms that wrote tons of Psalms by the name. They went by the name of the sons of Korah. We don't really know how many of them there were, but we know that there were several. But they wrote psalm after psalm after psalm that were prayers for healing for depression and anxiety and fear and worry and destructive thoughts. They prayed these things out to the point that they became songs and they made it into our Bible. Like they were so important that God said, I want you to understand this. I want you to see this because these are a big deal. It's not just a physical issue and it's not just a spiritual issue. There's something deeper that we've got to understand about this issue of depression, right? So this is what the sons of Korah, this entire Psalm, Psalm 42, you can read it. They continually ask the same questions. They're, they're, they're wrestling with this. And this, I'm going to read one verse because it's a little redundant, honestly. They just keep asking, emphasizing how important this is. But this is what they say in verse five. Why, my soul, are you downcast? They're talking to themselves. Right? They're crying out to God. They're talking about themselves and to themselves. They're saying, why so disturbed within me? Like, what is going on deep within me? Why the pain? Why the turmoil? Why the, why the things that I'm feeling? And then they're talking to themselves. Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. Right? But the point is this, is that it's not just a physical thing. It's not just a spiritual thing. But we've got to move to a deeper place of why. Why? Wherever you are right now, why? What's the root cause? What's the issue? What's the problem? What's causing that thing? Because this is what they're asking. Like, God, what is it? Why am I dealing with this depression? Why am I so down? What's what's the cause of this? It's not just that thing that happened last week. It's not just that that thing that happened last year. But God, what is the root issue of of this whole thing? Like, where is this whole thing started? Listen, the way we look at depression is very important. Very important. And here's what I want you to know. I want you to see your your depression. If you're depressed, you're feeling any of it, I want you to realize and see your depression as a symptom, not a disease. As a symptom of something deeper happening within you. That there's something that's broken in you. We're all broken. We're all flawed. We're all humans. But there's something deep within you that's broken. And the result of that brokenness is coming out in depression. But so often what we do is we see it as as, as a disease or as something else that we're just going to treat the problem. And all we're doing is treating a surface thing. We're not actually getting to the bottom of what's really going on. It's like a broken bone. If you have a broken bone, you're going to feel the pain, right? And the only way to fix the broken bone is to actually go to the physician and have them reset the bone, put it in a cast, whatever it is. But what you would never do is realize the pain, see the pain, experience the pain. That's an indicator. That's a symptom that there's something deeper going on. You would never just take ibuprofen and just go about your business. 
Because right? you're going to end up doing a lot more damage. Right? You're going to end up doing a lot more damage if you just simply take some pain medicine and then just try to endure the broken bone. Eventually, you've got to go to the doctor and you've got to say, hey, something's not right with my leg, my arm, my hand. Something is broken. I need to be fixed. And what I'm telling us as, us as a church is there is something broken within us that we've got to go to the great physician to have him heal within us, deep within us, that the result is coming out as depression and maybe even anxiety, maybe even some of these other things that we've been talking about, but there's something deep within us that's broken and we've got to get to that. We've got to, we've got to dig that thing up and allow the great physician to heal us, to heal that place, not just medicate the symptom, if that makes sense. I'm not against medication. Don't hear me say that at all. But studies show that medication alone won't get you anywhere. Even medication needs ongoing therapy. It needs a change of rhythm and habits and, and the way you eat and the way you exercise and the way you sleep. Like, it's not just take a pill and it's all going to be solved. I know people that have been on medication for 10 years and they're just as suicidal today as they were 10 years ago. Right? Because that's not necessarily going to fix the problem. There's something deeper that the great physician wants to fix. Right? Just, you know, that list is endless, by the way. Of, of how we're broken as human beings um, and where that is coming from. For some of us, it could be, um, it could be a, a bitterness, a root of bitterness or resentment, something that's been there for years and years and years, a wound or something that you've not been able to forgive someone. And you're, and you're holding resentment, you're holding bitterness, and it's become a poison in your heart. It's, be, it's beginning to affect the way you think, the way you live, the way you see the world. But you don't see that. You don't see the broken bone. You just see the result, the effect. It, it could be a something like, and this is for me, it could be perfectionism. Like, honestly, this is a big problem for me. I want everything perfect, and I think everything should be perfect. The problem is nothing is perfect. When nothing is perfect and you're a perfectionist and nothing is perfect, you kind of start giving up on life. Like, you don't even realize it. But inside you, you feel like everything should be right, but nothing is right. And eventually you go, well, then what's the, what's the use? Why should I even try anymore? I'm not going to get this right. They're not going to get this right. My wife's not going to get this right. My kids are not going to get this right. Eventually, I'm just going to give up on the whole thing. Maybe inside there's a brokenness, a spot of brokenness that's just narcissism, where you believe the entire world revolves around you, and you think way too much about yourself, and you think way too highly of yourself, right? And you just think everything revolves around you, and eventually that is going to erode and eat you alive. Or maybe it's the other end of the spectrum, and it's self-pity, and ingratitude, and you just, you, you think too lowly of yourself. You think too little of yourself, and you don't see the good things that God's provided. You don't see the blessings in your world. You don't see what God's doing. You don't see the purpose in your life, and you just kind of go into the self-pity kind of a place. The, the list is endless. I could go on and on. The fear of man, the need of approval, that I need someone else to approve of me and affirm me, right? It's a broken place within us because our affirmation can only come from our Heavenly Father, Right? Our identity and who we are can only come from him. But for a lot of us, we're hanging that on a parent. We're hanging that on, on, on some other person to give that to us, and it's never going to happen. We're broken. And then if I'm real honest with you, the one that hurts that we don't like to talk about is that the place within you that could be broken, that, that the result is depression, is sin. Sin. There could be a place in you, deep within you, a sin, a habitual sin that you've just not been willing to get rid of and be forgiven for. It could be big and ugly. It could be something that you just didn't even think was that big of a deal, but it's beginning to fester. It's beginning to become a problem because the way of Jesus begins with obedience. And if there's something in you that's just not right, then eventually it could even be that it's God's way of orchestrating an emotional response to go, hey, wake up, something's not right. Like open your eyes and see this thing. I can't tell you how many times I've talked with, with especially men that are battling depression. And when you ask questions, you find out that it's an addiction to porn. And it's been 10 years in the making and they're married and they've got kids and they just think, oh, it's not that big of a deal every now and then. But that one little seed, that one little problem just erodes the life that Jesus wants you to have. Depression is not a sin, but a sin could be causing an emotional response that looks like depression, feels like depression, becomes depression, right? There's all these different things, but the, thing, the sons of Korah are saying, why? Like, what's actually causing the pain? Not just how do I fix this feeling and this emotional response, not just how, I, how do I medicate, how do I get through that, but what's really creating this problem? What's really causing the pain that I'm dealing with right now? 
That's the question that we've got to ask because just like the broken bone, the only way we get healed is when we see the great physician and we allow him to heal the broken place. Not, a, not treat the symptoms, but actually heal the broken place within us because he is the great physician. Like that's what he is. That's who he is, right? As, as, as the gospel of Jesus Christ goes, you come to him as you are, broken, flawed, a disaster with legs, just a problem. You come to him as you are and he heals you. The gospel of religion says, hey, get all your junk together and then you can come to me. Right? And this is what Jesus came to, fought, to fight against. He said, that's not it at all, man. That's not the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is with your pain, with your brokenness, with your sin, with your narcissism, with your issues. Come to me, all who are weary, all who are heavy, all who are carrying this burden. Come to me and let me take it. Let me heal you. Let me fix you. Let me, let me put that leg in a stent. Let me do whatever I can do to bring wholeness to you. Because that's who he is. Listen, Jesus says this in three of the four Gospels. This, this, this one line is, is recorded, and I'm going to read it from Luke 5. Jesus said, who goes to the doctor for a cure? Those who are well or those who are sick? I've not come to call the righteous, but to call those who fail to measure up and bring them to repentance. Those that fail to measure up. Does that sound familiar to anybody else? That have problems? And issues. That's us. Every one of us. We live in a fallen world. The first question is, why am I feeling the way I'm feeling? And as I said, depression will sneak up on you. It'll just all of a sudden show up one day and it'll be there and you won't even realize it. People will start saying, hey, what's going on with you? You're not acting yourself right now. What's happening? And you didn't even realize it. Those kind of things start happening and you need to be a son of Korah. You need to say, well, well why? Why? What's going on in me? What's the thought process? What's the, what's the thing that's creating this? Right? What is it? Dig it out because there's a pain. There's something deep within you that's just not right. And the heart of your God is that he wants to get to that place and he wants to heal that place. He wants to bring wholeness to that place. And then what? I'm going to give you just a couple of really practical things. These kind of just next steps that help me so much as I dig and as I look and as I get deep within my soul and I say, why is my soul so disturbed and downcast? Why am I feeling the things that I'm feeling? And the first one is this, and this is a little bit difficult, but this is the first thing. Think about what you're thinking about. I know it's a little Mr. Miyagi, wax on, wax off. Think about what you're thinking about, right? Because we know this, we talk about this a lot, that your thoughts determine your direction. Your thoughts determine where you're gonna go, what you're gonna do, the life you're gonna have, it all begins in your thoughts. And Proverbs 4 even confirms this. Proverbs 4 says, be careful how you think. Your life is shaped by your thoughts. Your life right now is the sum total of your thoughts to this point. They've gotten you there. The thing is, it's a little bit like the parable about how do you tell a fish about the water? Like, how do you explain water to a fish, right? You've heard this parable before. You've heard this conundrum, right? This is a little bit like our thoughts, right? Because the fish is so submersed in water, it's just so normal that it doesn't even realize that it's in water. Just like your mind, your thoughts, you're so submersed in those same thoughts that you've had for years and years and years and years that it's very difficult for you to actually see those thoughts that you're swimming in. It's very difficult. But the moment that you can, you, you can begin to interrogate those thoughts. This is, a, this is an interesting idea. Um, the thoughts that you have that run your life, that you believe without thinking about them, are typically wrong. Think about that. The, the majority of your thoughts are probably wrong. But yet you believe them as if they're truth. You believe them as if they're truth. Why? Because they're your thoughts. And if they're your thoughts, then surely they're true and they're right and they're good. But how often do your thoughts align with the thoughts of God? I mean, for some of us, maybe a little bit, but for a lot of us, not a whole lot. It takes time. It takes training. It takes doing what Paul said when he said this. He said, he said to go on to the next one, 2 Corinthians, we take every thought captive to make it obedient to Christ. It takes years of going, whoa, 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 hang on, let me grab that thought. Mm, that didn't quite sound right. Let's compare it to the word of God. Let's see how Jesus would approach that. How is he going to think about that? Let me make that obedient to Christ. Okay, now we can continue. 
But if we don't even see our thoughts, then how in the world can we do that? If we don't even stop and think about what we're thinking about, think about the, the train that our thoughts are that is just full speed ahead. There's no stopping it. It is a, it is a wide open, full on bullet that is leading your life somewhere. How do we stop that and begin to think about those thoughts? And then Paul said this in Philippians 4. He said, fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about the things that are excellent and worthy of praise. How do we take all those negative thoughts, anxiety and depression and fear thoughts and fix them, apply them and, and just get them completely locked into God's thinking? Right? It begins with thinking about what you're thinking about taking that thought captive and making obedient to Jesus Christ. The second thing that I would say is this, is that we've got to pray honest prayers. We've got to pray honest prayers. I can't tell you how often I hear people pray and it's sweet, nice, uh, cliche, little Christianese prayers. And we wonder why our prayer life is boring, right? Because we think our prayers are meant to be neat and nice and tidy and God honoring. But you don't find that anywhere in the Bible, especially in the Psalms. You see the opposite. The Psalms are full of prayers that are raw and open and honest and just yelling at God. You, you literally can read prayers. I'm going to read one in just a second. That it feels like they are angry at God. He's an angry elf. And he's just ye yelling at God. And God says, listen, I'm going to put it in the Bible because I want you to know that this is how I want you to pray. I want you to be real. I want you to be authentic when you are full of pain and hurt and turmoil. I want to know. I don't want you to hide behind some Christianese and I better have my act together. No, no, no. I want you to lay everything bare and say, this is me, God. I'm battling. I'm frustrated. I'm angry with you a little bit right now. I need to see light. I need to see hope. I need to see truth. The same sons of Korah. Look at what they said in Psalm 88. Oh, Lord, why do you reject me? Why do you turn your face from me? I've been sick and close to death since my youth. I stand helpless and desperate before your terrors. Your fierce anger has overwhelmed me. Your terrors have paralyzed me. They swirl around me like floodwaters all day long. They have engulfed me completely. You have taken away my companions and my loved ones. Darkness is my closest friend. God wanted us to see this. He wanted us to see that these men of God, these, these worshipers in the temple, these, this is the prayers that they are praying to their God. Like, God, I don't understand. I don't get it. I feel like you've left me. You've rejected me. What is going on? He wanted us to see this. He wanted us to experience this. These, these are the kind of prayers that we're meant to pray. Not boring, simple, little, little simple prayers, little Sunday school prayers. Now, what's really going on? I used to tell teenagers all the time, God's big enough to handle your anger at him. He's big enough. Tell him. Tell him the place you need to take all of that is to him. That's where a relationship begins with someone. It's just dropping the veil, dropping all the walls and the filters and going, this is all of me, baby. This is the real me. That's how relationships are built. And God wants, you know, the thing is God knows it already. Hebrews 4 tells us he knows it. He knows everything that there is to know about you. He just wants you to tell him. Pray honest prayers. Today, God, I'm battling and I'm dealing with this. Why do I feel like I'm alone? Why do I feel like you've left me? Why do I feel like you've abandoned me? God, I'm dealing with this today. Pray honest prayers with God and watch what happens. The third thing I would say is this, is focus on others. Focus on others because depression pulls us into ourselves Depression isolates. Depression just makes me go, I'm, I'm going to be all by myself, my thoughts. I, I can figure this thing out. This is all about me, right? It, it naturally pulls us to a place of isolation. Instead of pulling relationships close, the people that we love, the people that love us, pulling them close. You know, the, the verse that we read in 1 Kings 19 of Elijah literally praying, God, kill me. Let me show you the verse before that. 1 Kings 19.3. Elijah was afraid and fled for his life. He went to Beersheba, a town in Judah, and he left his servant there. Then he went on alone into the wilderness. 
He left his companion and then went alone into the wilderness. He was afraid. He was full of fear. Life wasn't going the way he wanted it to go. Things were beginning to attack. There was a darkness. There was a heaviness beginning to happen. So what did he say to the guy that literally was his armor bearer that was with him day and night that would have protected him to the death? The guy that loved him, the companion, the guy that was there for him. He said, you stay there. I'm going to go deal with my own demons. I'm going to go deal with my own darkness. I'm going to go into the wilderness by myself. What would have happened if that guy or Elijah would have said, no, 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 hey, brother, I need you right now. I need you more than I've ever needed you. Depression and my thoughts and my emotions are telling me to isolate from you, but I feel like I need to be close. I need to open up. I need someone around me. I need people that love me. I need relationships. This is why, to me, small groups are so important to a Christian. Because I need people around me that are going to look at me and go, no, 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 man, I'm not going to let you go into the wilderness by yourself. Absolutely no way. I'm with you to the death. I will walk with you. I'm going to get up underneath that solitary broom tree with you. I'm going to eat that angel cake too. I'm going to be right there with you all the way through this thing. You're not going to get away from me. Right? I'm going to focus on other people. I'm going to get into a group. I'm going to to love my family more. I'm going to do everything that I can do to get the spotlight off of me onto someone else. I'm also going to serve people. Again, depression isolates, it pulls me in and it's all about me. What if you do the opposite and you begin to serve other people? For me, one of the biggest things was just simply serving my wife. Because what I wanted to do was sit on the couch and not do anything. When I got home from work, I was fatigued and tired and my thoughts were just all over the place. And all I wanted to do was just isolate and go into a little bit of a bubble. But I had a counselor that said, hey, why don't you, why don't you make yourself get up for 30 minutes a day and just serve your wife? So I started doing the dishes. Folding some clothes. Some might say amen. Like I just slowly was like, all right. Again, it's not about me because y'all know I didn't want to do that. It's about her. And I'm going to love her. I'm going to serve her. I'm going to get outside of my little bubble, my little world, and I'm going to do something for someone else. And it slowly began to change how I see the world around me. What if you served your family, your kids, the coworkers? What if you got on a serve team? What if you got a part of an outreach around here and you begin to love other people? What if you were at a door or you were in a parking lot and you were just a part of something bigger than you, focused on someone else other than you? I guarantee you it would begin to change everything. Focus on others. And the last thing I would say is this, and I'm wrapping up, and it's fight to be fully alive. This is my heart for us as a church, for you as individuals, for your families, is for you to be fully alive. But I can't make that decision for you. Man, I wish I could. I I wish I could. I wish I could just reach into your home, reach into your mind, and just flip that switch so that fully alive was something that you wanted. Jesus can't even do that. He gave us the the ability of free will. He said, no, no, if you want fully alive and you want to experience the life that is abundant, then you've got to decide for yourself. What does that mean? That means that every day I got to wake up to fight for joy, to fight for peace, to fight to feel again, fight to be interested in life, fight to serve, fight to love people, fight to, fight to get outside of my own problems. I got to fight for every bit of fully alive that I can get my hands on. It's up to me to fight that battle. It's up to me. I've got to make that decision. I got to put myself in the right places at the right times to do it. And the thing is, is that Jesus said, and this is so crazy, but Jesus promised us that just because we're Christ followers doesn't mean that all the pain and the sorrow goes away. He actually said the opposite. He said, I promise you pain. I promise you sorrows because we live in a fallen world. There's gonna be hard times. There's gonna be, there's gonna be things that are gut-wrenching and difficult. And he says this in John 16, He says, here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows. He's promising that. In other words, your sorrows, your problems, your depression, your anxiety, your fear, your, your, your loneliness, your suicidal thoughts, he's not surprised. He literally said, guys, it's gonna happen. Hey, it's gonna happen. You're gonna go through dark seasons. You're going to go through times when you want to give up. You're going to go through times that just feels like a fight every single day for every little glimpse of life. It feels like that. But then he said, but take heart because I've overcome the world. Take heart because with me, it's all possible because I've overcome every bit of it. I've overcome it all. Jesus said, listen, lean into me and I will walk through this battle with you and I will fight your battle with you and for you. 
I will be in your corner every single day fighting your battle. We fight by getting closer and closer and closer to him and realizing that when we're up against the battle of our life, the best place we can be is the presence of God. Because then we realize that he's actually fighting our battles for us. It's not me. There's only so much I can do. It's not just a physical thing. It's a spiritual thing. And when we step into the presence of God and we realize that he's fighting our battles, and we stay close to him, we're going to sing this song again in just a second. And for right now, I just want you to sit tight. I don't want you to leave. I don't want you to walk around. But so often we think salvation. But salvation is just Jesus saving us from hell. But it's so much more than that. Jesus is not just saving us from hell, but he's saving us from death and all of his friends while we walk on this earth. If we lean into him, he's saving us from fear. He's saving us from anxiety. He's saving us from depression. He's saving us from loneliness. He's saving us from all of these things that the enemy is dragging us into because he wants to pull you back to death. But when we get in the presence of God, we realize that Jesus is bringing freedom to all those things. He's bringing life to all of me. I've got to stay in his presence. I've got to fight to be fully alive. I've got to fight to stay in his presence so that I know, that I know, that I know that he'll never turn his back on me. That he's going to fight with me. He's going to fight for me. So here's what I'm going to do. I want to pray for us. Then we're going to sing this song again. We're going to stand. We're going to sing it out with everything that we've got. And maybe you're in the middle of a battle. And maybe it's not even the battle of depression. It's a different battle. Get into the presence of God. Watch him fight your battles. Get close to him so that you can see it and experience it, so your faith will be boosted, so your heart, your passion, your love, your heart will just beat again because you'll see your God, your king, fight for you. God, right now, I just lift up every person that's listening to me, every person that's a part of our church right now. I just pray, God, that in this moment that we will sense, we will feel, we will get completely lost in your presence. God, as you fight our battles, Lord, I pray that we fight to be fully alive, that we fight to be in your presence, that we fight, God, to change our thoughts, that we fight, Lord, to be around people, to to have people speak into us, God, that we fight to pray honest and raw prayers, God, that we fight to get to the root of the issue, God, that we fight all of these battles, but ultimately, God, as we get closer and closer to you, God, that we can experience you, that we can take heart because you've overcome it all. God, we can take heart, Lord, because in you there is freedom, there is life. God, you conquer death and all of his friends. And Lord, right now we walk into your presence. In Jesus' name we pray. Lord, we love you. Amen. This is how I